to our ministerial formation. Allow me to welcome you to this unit that is known as Anglican Ecclesiology. Just as you are aware, Anglicanum is that Anglican Ecclesiology necessitates the thinking of the Ecclesia Anglicana. Ecclesia Anglicana is a church that has its origin and basis in England. Just as you are aware, the history of the Anglican church is stated to have come from three distinct historical development. Number one, in the first century, in the first century, the apostles or the apostolic fathers reached with the gospel in England and established the church. In fact, the first ecumenical council of the church contains some bishops from the Isles of England, from the English, from the England Highland. Five, that is the first century. In 597, Anselm of, no, Augustine of Canterbury was sent by the Pope to go and revert and revitalize the church. And he became the first Archbishop of uh, Canterbury, 597. The third historical development of the Anglican Church happened in the 16th century, where there was a man that was called uh, Henry VIII. He wanted a divorce with his wife, who was known as Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon was sharing babies who are girls, but he wanted a male hair. And you must know that Henry was notorious. He did not only divorce Catherine, he divorced other three wives. And among them, one of them was killed for adultery. So you'll find it is his trend. If you want to look for mistakes of ladies, you'll always find or anybody. So the Anglican Church had its origin in the first century, 597, and also in the Protestant Reformation. And the Anglican Church was commenced, was started because of three reasons. Number one, the personal reason of Henry VIII, he wanted a male heir and he wanted a divorce, but the Pope could not grant him a divorce. Therefore, he established a national church. Number two, there were political reasons. The people of England were tired of being ruled from Rome, so they wanted to establish their own national church. Number three, there were ecclesiastical reasons. People like Thomas Cranmer, the architects of the book of the Book of Common Prayer wanted to reform the church. But today we don't want to delve into the history. Today we want to look at Anglican ecclesiology. That is the church, the Anglican church, in its expression and in, in, in its system of church government. We look at what constitutes the Anglican ecclesiology. There are four distinct marks of Anglican ecclesiology. Number one, the Anglican church is universal. That is simultaneously divided, united. It is simultaneously divided into different churches in different provinces, but they are united without a universal jurisdiction like the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church have a universal jurisdiction. The Pope is the Pope of the entire Catholic Church. But in the Anglican Church, there is no universal jurisdiction. The Archbishop of Canterbury is considered the first among equals 
He can only give an advisory role, but he cannot force any of the local or national churches to implement a decision. So it is more of a symbolic or a figurehead, it's more symbolic, ordinary role rather than a functionary role. That is the Archbishop of Canterbury. So you must know that the Anglican is universal, but without a universal jurisdiction. We are universal. That's why we have always had a series of Lambeth Conference. From 1860s, after 10 years, bishops of the Anglican Church meet. We are universal. We are virtually everywhere. But we do not have a universal jurisdiction. Like Catholics, when they appoint bishops, the committee here, the local committee, appoints, it nominates three. And it is the fourth. In Rome, who makes the final appointment for the bishop? It is a universal jurisdiction, distinct from ours. Therefore, you must understand Anglican ecclesiology is anchored, number one, on its universality. Number two, the Anglican church is not only universal, it is also provincial or national. Sometimes it is known as the local church. And I want to tell you, every local church is autonomous. Every province is autonomous. And I want to give you instances so that you understand what I am trying to drive home. One, the Lambeth Conference that was there last, that was there this year, it was uh, in around April this year. It was a gathering of all bishops from around the world. There are provinces that said we are not going to, we are going, we are not going to attend and partake of the Lambeth Conference because there are some provinces that still entertain gazing. Despite the compromise, there are provinces that are autonomous especially Uganda and Nigeria, they were quite unequivocal. unequivocal. They did not attend. So every, every local church, with every local church, every provincial church, or every national church is autonomous. By the way, are you aware that the provincial constitution is supreme over the diocesan constitution? I am also aware that diocesan bishops pay due and canonical obedience to the archbishop. And also, are you not aware that when the provincial constitution changes, it is automatic that every diocese will change their constitution to be in a line with the provincial constitution. Therefore, the Anglican Church is not only universal, it is also provincial or national. Number three, the Anglican Church is diocesan. And in the diocesan, the Anglican Church is synodically, no, it is episcopally led and synodically governed. It is, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, episcopally led. We are episcopal authorities vested on the bishop. And it is synodically governed so that it checks the excesses of the office. We believe that man is created in the image and the likeness of God. And since man is created in the image of the likeness of God, he is able to lead. That's why the bishop is given the mandate to lead. But we know man is also fallen. That's why he needs to be checked with the diocesan synods. The same with the provincial synods. 
That's what you must understand. Number three, our Anglican Church Ecclesiology, we must understand that the Anglican Church is parochial. That is the smallest ecclesiastical unit that has a lot of bearing in the church. It doesn't mean that we dispute the local church, but the magnitude of the diocesan, of the parochial uh, unit is very, very critical. Therefore, as we do Anglican Ecclesiology, you must be aware of these particular trends in the Anglican Church. Now, let's look at the history of the Anglican Ecclesiology. We are going to look at it in depth as we study it. The first phase of Anglican Ecclesiology was the 16th century Reformed Church. The 16th century, you remember people like Thomas Cram. You remember Hag Latimer. You remember Nicholas Ridley. These patriarchs of the Anglican Church had an Anglican ecclesiology, but its bent was toward Protestantism. It rebelled against Catholicism. You'll find that uh, the emphasis on scripture and its authority and the church was seen as an entity that expresses the gospels through the word and the sacrament. But the orientation was protestant. From there, we go to the second phase, that is the 17th century. From the 16th century, the second phase of Anglican ecclesiology was the 17th century. That is where we had a group known as the Carolina Divines. The Carolina Divines, you see, in the first century, Catholicism was just accommodated, but the church was veering towards Protestantism. But in the Carolina Divines, the church now made a distinct ecclesiology. They established the terms, like Cooper, the terms of uh, Anglican Church being via media. Not completely Catholic, neither is it totally Protestant. The Carolina Divines. And that is how they express the beauty of Anglican theology. The Anglican Church based on uh, a three-legged school stool. That is, our theology is based on reason, scripture, and church traditions. Three-legged uh, stool. You remember that uh, later, there was a bit of a battle between uh, the Protestants who were in the Anglican Church. There were those who were extremes, the Puritans. They wanted us to completely be cut off from Catholic things that appeared to them to be Catholicish. They wanted us to be completely Protestants. Therefore, they fought, and it led to the third phase of Anglicanism or Anglican ecclesiology. It is the latitudinalism. Latitudinalism, this is the place where now they decided to tolerate these people who are extreme. They were tolerated and allowed to operate their churches as independent unity. By the way, you know, the Church of England was a state church. But during the time, the third phase, the third phase of Anglicanism, latitud latitudinalism, allowed our church to have these people operate their own churches. They were given freedom. Those who are committed to reform uh, Protestantism and they were slightly now away from the fall. And uh, at this time, people emphasized so much on the Enlightenment. Enlightenment is not scripture, but it's morality. The church will just emphasize on morality, not like the Reformation. You remember the watch words in Reformation, sola gratia. 
grace alone. Sola fide, salvation by faith alone. Sola scripture, scripture alone was considered the ultimate source of authority. Sola Christus, for salvation it was Christ alone, not the works. So the emphasis now has turned to irrationalism and trying to bridge and try to make sense of our faith with the science and the development that was there. The fourth phase, which was in the 19th century, there were three distinct groups now appeared in the Anglican Ecclesiology. The first phase was there arose the law church. Is the Oxford move during that time of the Oxford movement? There arose the Lord Church. Some of the people are like Charles Simon and William Wilberforce. By the way, do you know William Wilberforce? He was the campaigner of anti slavery, very committed evangelicals. So, in the, in the fourth phase of the Anglican Church, there arose three groups. Number one, they were the low Anglicans. The ecclesiology of the low Anglicans, they emphasized preaching, concern preaching the gospel. Gospel and preaching the word to them is more critical. And even engaging in social action like William Wilberforce. Then another group is the High Church Oxford Movement. The High Church, they emphasize the ancient Catholic tradition and heritage. So the emphasis was uh, things to do with uh, sacraments, especially Holy Communion. But even at that time, people like John Henry Newman, John Henry Newman still emphasized the via media nature of our church. But later, the man defected and he went back to the Roman Catholic. Lastly, there is a broad based movement. The broad based movement are the, the liberals. And uh, they, 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 they wanted to align church teachings with such new doctrines like evolution and the questions over the authority of scripture and emphasis on human rights and things like that. You will find that tradition within Anglican ecclesiology. Then uh, they emphasize so much on rationalism and the change that was there. Then the fifth phase of Anglicanism as the church developed. The fifth phase of Anglicanism was what we is called the Lambeth Conference. The growth of the Lambeth Conference. And the Anglican Communion came into being. In 1867, from 1867, bishops have been meeting in the Lambeth Palace after 10 years. Sometimes an event happens like COVID or something like that. But after 10 years, that is when they met. And key to this was what we call the Chicago Lambeth Korean. That is what we believe as Anglicans, the Chicago Lambeth Quadriapol. And the Chicago Lambeth Quadriapol is in four things. We believe in four things as Anglicans. Now the communion is consolidated. And uh, you will find what I've mentioned as you look at the Anglican ecclesiology. You will find that there are so many divergences and differences, and yet there are so many correlations. But the thing that unites us as the Anglican Church are four things. Number one, the authority of Scripture, the Bible. The Bible is authoritative in matters of orthodoxy and 
praxis. Number two, the two sacraments. The two sacraments. That is the apostolic creed. No, the two sacraments. That is baptism and holy communion. Unlike the Catholics who have seven sacraments, we have two. And every Anglican agrees with the Bible. Every Anglican, we may disagree on interpretation, but we believe that the Bible is authoritative. Number two, we agree on the two sacraments. We are in consensus and concurrence on the two sacraments. The two sacraments are the Bible, the uh, Holy Communion, and baptism. The second, the third thing that we agree on is the two creeds, the Apostolic Creed and the Nicene Creed. We concur on the two creeds. The fourth thing that we agree with is what we call the historical episcopate. We believe in the perpetual episcopate. Since the second century, the office of the bishop has been in existence. And there is no time the office of the bishop can be vacant. No time. Even when a bishop retires, the archbishop takes charge. Like right now, we are in Capeguria Diocese. You may say that uh, we don't have a bishop, but we do. That bishop is our bishop. Until there will be an episcopal election and later a consecration or enthronement of a bishop. So we believe in the historical episcopate that the office of the bishop has been in existence from the apostolic church. And that is what we believe in. And I want to say, we have looked, when we look at an Anglican ecclesiology, it is episcopal in its nature. Why? Because the office of the bishop is very, very critical in Anglican ecclesiology. And as we look at Anglican ecclesiology, we are going to look at the office of the bishop. Very critically, the bishop in a diocese is a symbol of unity. The bishop is the chief shepherd. He is the defender of the Christian faith. The bishop is very critical. He ordains and sends ministers. And in fact, ministers, he is the CEO of a particular diocese. We are going to look at in depth of the office of the bishop. Very critical in the Anglican communion. We have looked superficially at the role of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Anglican communion uh, figureheads, the Archbishop of Canterbury. We have at the provincial level, the Archbishop is very, very critical. He's critical in uh, consecrations and enthronements of bishops. He's also very critical, he's a symbol of the unity of the local church or the national church. He is the spokesman. Nobody can speak on the behalf of the Anglican Communion in Kenya, or the Anglican Church in Kenya, except the Archbishop. He is our spokesman. And he's critical in executing church discipline, especially in the bigger offices of the bishops of the church. He triggers the mechanism in the constitution that can be used for discipline. And he's also the custodian of the Anglican Constitution, the provincial constitution that is very critical. He's also very critical in the process of uh, the, uh, the episcopal election of a bishop. He midwives the process with his office from the SAC team. That's why a bishop is a, is a bishop of the entire church. The entire church chooses a bishop. Right now, as the constitution is, they are 
seven delegates, seven delegates in the electoral college from the province, 16 from the diocese. Eight are lay, eight are clergy. And for those who do not know, is that uh, you will always have the honorary treasurer and uh, the vice chair, the vice, the vice chair of the synod, and uh, you will have the four, you know, the six, the, the vice chair and the clerical secretary, and the six who are elected clergy to be part of the standing committee, not appointed by virtue of their position. Not actually those who are elected the six plus the other two they become eight. Then you have the honorary treasurer and the lay secretary, and you have the six laymen who are appointed to be part of the standing committee of the synod. Those six plus those eight plus eight, sixteen come from the diocese. Seven come from the province. And so the province is very critical in the elections of the bishop. That's why the bishop is rightly a bishop of the church. And if you want to trigger a mechanism of discipline, it has to involve the, the, the Episcopal Synod. There is the Provincial Episcopal Synod. It's a symbol of the bishop. If there any recommendation it goes there, then a tribunal is formed. The same system happens to the archbishop. The office of the bishop is very critical in the ordination, the sending of ministers. And if the CEO is answerable to the standing committee of the synod, though he chairs because of the balance. Later, we look at the office of the archdeacon. The archdeacon and, uh, is at par. Before the archdeacon, we go to the office of the vicar general. The office of the G vicar general, his function is really administrative and is something between most and the north when the bishop has taken a sabbatical. His role is only active when there is no bishop in ordinary. But uh, a vicar general, when the bishop is there, his role is very superficial. We look, we look at the office of the vicar general. And we are going to look at uh, this book will be our main source. The ideal Anglican protocol and job descriptions. The ideal Anglican protocol and job description written by Bishop Emeritus of uh, Butel Diocese, Tim Wambunya, and uh, Benjamin Kibar. And we are also going to consult some sources and even some diocesan manuals because the Anglican Church is universal, it is national, it is diocesan, and the Anglican Church is parochial. You will find that there are different emphases in different places. But so far, this book, I've looked at it and I have discovered that it's much agreeable. We are going to look at the roles very, very critical. The office of the archdeacon, more often than not, is very, very, very administrative. In matters of discipline, he recommends, when there are issues of discipline, he can recommend to the bishop for a tribunal to be formed to investigate a clergy within his jurisdiction. In matters of discipline, in matters of discipline, matters of discipline, in matters of architecture, he looks at the outward buildings and does recommendations. When I when we wanted to build the church that is at St. John's Kimenini, at the moment, 
Our archbishop by then was uh, the vicar general, so he doubled as the vicar general of Kitana Diocese, the venerable Paul Daisoka. I took the plan to his office because it is the work of the art deacon to look at structures and recommend them to the decision uh, invest property and investment committee so that it is ratified and the building is constructed as per the standard of safety and regulation. According to the constitution, you ensure that people with disability have a place. That's the role of the arch deacon. The arch deacon has no spiritual role. In fact, he only comes to the parish, he's allowed to preach by the vicar. The vicar has the spiritual role, but the arch deacon does not have the spiritual role. His role is mainly administrative. So more than that, all these days they want to arrogate themselves a spiritual role, but theirs is mainly administration. They sit in virtually all the committees and the boards of the diocese because they represent an archdeacon. They are the bishop's uh, principal assistants. They are the bishop's principal assistants. And you'll find that uh, these archdeacons are critical in presenting deacons during ordinations. They present. They are part of the bishops examining chaplaincy. Some of them depending on the institution. So the office of the archdeacon is very, very critical. They coordinate and ensure decision policies are implemented at the particular uh, level, uh, parochial and even at the deanery level. So the function of the archdeacon is mostly administrative in Rome. They can even advise bishops on transfers. Now the bishop can allow him, can allow them, though it is the sole responsibility of the bishop. But he can allow them to advise and consult on certain changes they want to take. They may be asked where there is a vacancy to hold a brief as they await for the vicar. During acrimonious handing over and taking over, the archdeacon may come to facilitate the process so that there is smooth transition. At par with the archdeacon, at par with the archdeacon, is the provost. In an Anglican church, the archdeacon is known as the venerable. The venerable. The provost is known as the very reverend. The very reverend. Among all the reverends is the only one. The very reverend. An archdeacon is uh, collected and installed. The same happens to the provost. And the provost, more often than not, when there is a full established cathedral, with a cathedral chapter, they advertise, that has been the trend. They advertise for the position, they interview, it happened in Kitan, when now there was a full-fledged uh, cathedral, with a cathedral chapter. And they interview, and they can give not more than three names to the bishop for appointment. And uh, one of our former tutors, the very, the very, he's now the provost elect. He will be installed very soon and be known as the very reverend, the very reverend Elkana Osiru, provost of St. Luke's Cathedral. And more often than not, they are given a security tenure of uh, maybe two terms, five, five years, ten years, depending on the different cathedrals and their emphasis. So the provost is critical in the liturgy. And you know the chief liturgist of all dioceses is the bishop. But he's assisted by the provost. In preparing the different services, he prepares the liturgy for the same. Maybe 
invited in most of the diocesan committees, depending with the diocesan constitution. The provost is supposed to be a role model, especially in liturgy, because the center of a liturgy and the mother church of all the entire diocese is the cathedral. And it should be a role model in terms of giving liturgy, singing. That's why you have the best choirs from the cathedral. They are supposed to be the role model. And um, at that, also, we have the diocesan administrative secretary. I say he may be a clutch or even a late. The constitution allows for both a clergy or a lady. But because more often the Lord interacts with the priests, they have said that let him more and more dioceses find it to be prudent that the diocesan administrative secretary becomes a priest, or these days an archdeacon. And uh, what? He maintains the diocesan records, keeps the records. It's very, very critical. Many records that are needed from the diocese, like the deed of consecration, the certificates of ordination, all that are in the custody of the, of the, of the, of the administrative secretary. During transitions and elections of bishops, they are very critical as they act as a link. Especially if they are not contesting. If they are contesting, they resign for someone else to act. But they are very critical in that. They coordinate the activities in the diocese, parishes and archdeaconaries. The archdeacon is very critical on, this, on those matters. They also do what they are assigned by the bishops. Some of them are very powerful, some of them are mildly powerful. But it is a very, very critical office in the coordination of the activities of the diocese. And, uh, and, and uh, during the swear, during the taking of oath, in case the chancellor is not around, the, um, the diocesan administrative secretary may act on their behalf to lead the ordinance in uh, taking this oath of office, oath of canonical obedience, and all that. It's a very, very, very critical office. So they ensure that the decision policies are implemented and also uh, most of them act as secretaries for the board of finances, for the board of finance. They are secretaries in the board of finance. They take minutes. They also ensure that the, that the decision synod resolution are well documented and they ensure that they are implemented. From there, we go to the rural dean. The rural dean function is mostly fellowship and missions. They start missions within the deanery and they have people do missions around the deanery, and they encourage and enhance fellowship within the gladys in the dinner. Sometimes useful in um, they are mostly they are always more more spiritual, pastoral rather than administrative. As we look at the bishops, I forgot to mention that there are four kinds of bishops. You're going to look at all of them. There is the bishop in ordinary or the diocesan bishop. He has all the authority and uh, he sends priests, ordains, makes beacons and ordains priests and is in charge of the, of the um, is, is, is the one that is um, chairing the, the synod and even the standing committee of the synod. The second uh, uh, type of bishop is Bishop Ko Ajuta. Bishop Ko Ajuta in Kiswahili and into a Askofu Mrefi. He has the right of succession to the throne. Normally, if the bishop says that there will be acrimony 
after his departure, he can initiate the process of electing a bishop earlier before his time ends. And he's episcopally elected following all the pro all the all the, the vacancies declared. Then the nominations, people who are nominated, they send their nominations to the chancellor, the Asian chancellor. Then a such team comes. It comprises of diocesan members, and it is the prerogative of the Archbishop to pick such members from both the province and the diocese. And after they ask the question, after they are interviewed, the such team should list three, and the three go to an Episcopal election. And in an Episcopal election, one is elected the first time if the leading candidate does not get um, uh, two-thirds majority, the second candidate, the, the second round is ensured. But the one with the least votes is eliminated. Then with the two, if they don't get, if the, the leading candidate does not get two-thirds, the third round we go for elections. And a simple majority determines the winner. Twelve votes will enable someone to be elected. So from there we have a vicar in charge. Vicar in charge and his role is both spiritual and, and uh, administrative. He chairs the PCC. He ensures that uh, there is harmony and concurrence in the parish. He is a minister of the word and sacraments. Shares the PCC, just as I've said, is both spiritual and administrative. Then we have other offices that we will mention and highlight. We have the curate in charge. Sometimes a curate is meant to be in charge. The vicar means someone who sits on the behalf of someone else. Later, we'll look at the, the beacons and what they do. Sometimes they are meant to be curates, and uh, sometimes a curates in charge, it depends on the personnel in the diocese. Later, we look at even the bishop's office and the function of the bishop's secretary, the bishop's driver, uh, the bishop's uh, chaplain. We're going to look at that as we look at Anglican ecclesiologists. These are critical offices in Anglican ecclesiology. But for that, that's a very concise summary of Anglican ecclesiology. Just mentioning the precepts or the summary of the big offices or the critical offices. You will find the office of the curate will explain. Curate me Kasisi Ama Shemas and by Hannah Mamlak without authority. He cannot convene a parish church council. He cannot convene a local church council. His work is mainly to cure the souls, spiritual, pastoral, but not necessarily administrative, unless a role has been delegated. We are going to look at all, even the lay office bearers in the diocese. We are going to look at uh, secretary, treasurer, um, people who are dead, vicars who are dead, what are some of their roles? So that you understand as you go and minister. That's why this is a higher planning, it's called ministerial formation. So that you understand Anglican ecclesiology, how it is anchored, the rationale behind it. And you look at the various offices. We don't know. Maybe 10 years to come, some of you will be archdeacons, some of you will be bishop, some of you will be rodeans, and now you'll have the power to invite me as the rural dean of a particular area. I come and preach. I was your tutor, but now you are senior than me. And I want to tell you this ministry, things change as I go through this issue. There is an archdeacon who was my archdeacon in 2002. Ten years later, ten years later, in 20, 
not 20, 13 years later, 2016, I was the archdeacon and he was the fifth church. Therefore, all these positions know that there are only three permanent offices in the Anglican Church. The office of the bishop, the office of the priest, and the office of the people. The rest, all these positions are appointment and disappointments. They are temporary. Vicar, administrative secretary, uh, provost, um, all of them are both appointments and disappointments. Today you are one, tomorrow you might not be. So remember the permanent thing is that you are a priest or a deacon. Or a bishop. Once a bishop, always a bishop. Once a priest, always a bishop. Always a priest. After we who are suspended, you will be restored to the same position. Once a deacon, always a deacon. But you can be upgraded when you are uh, ordained priest. May the Lord bless you as you serve in the Anglican Church. May you understand the Anglican Ecclesiology. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.